Dwelling in the deep pools of the Nechaco Stewart River system is a survivor from the age of the dinosaurs, the Nechaco white sturgeon. The sturgeon is the largest freshwater fish in Canada and has remained unchanged for millions of years. The Nechaco white sturgeon is now on the brink of extinction. It is ranked as critically imperiled by the BC Conservation Data Center and listed as an endangered species under the Species at Risk Act. The Nechaco River system is important for its unique ecological attributes. It also supports First Nations fisheries and recreational fisheries and provides water for agricultural purposes, power production, and various other outdoor recreational activities. The Nechaco white sturgeon population has dropped from what scientists believe was a minimum of 5,000 fish to less than 300. The vast majority of remaining fish are more than 40 years old. It appears that since 1960 to 1970, few young sturgeon have survived. The lack of younger fish, or recruitment failure, as termed by biologists, means that sturgeon young are not surviving to adulthood. The Nechaco White Sturgeon Recovery Initiative has determined that sturgeon in the Nechaco Stewart system are indeed spawning, but not enough eggs are surviving to maintain the population. The Nechaco White Sturgeon Recovery Initiative has performed a number of habitat-related experiments to find out why so few fish are surviving. So far, it seems that one of the reasons may be too much sand and silt in the spawning areas. This fine sediment can fill in small hiding spots between gravel and also cover the sticky eggs, impairing their ability to breathe. Recruitment failure may be directly or indirectly related to water flow management and Nechaco Reservoir operation. Other possible relevant factors, land practices upstream, altered habitat, or changes in availability of food resources in rearing habitat. Sturgeon in the Nechaco reach spawning age around 20 to 25 years of age for males and more, and as late as 40 years for females. Spawning is triggered by an increase in spring water temperatures and preferred spawning sites have faster currents. Once mature, females spawn more than once, but only every three to 10 years depending on the availability of food, such as salmon. Females and males migrate in loose groups and tend to broadcast spawn together where they release eggs and milt into the water near the river bottom. The small black eggs quickly sink into the porous river bed where they stick to the rocks and gravel. There they're relatively safe from predators. The accumulation of fine sediments causes the larva to use more energy, drifting further down the river to find a suitable spot and this can cause increased exposure to natural predators. A sturgeon did not begin spawning until they are 20 to 40 years old. The low number of young sturgeon in the Nechaco means that an entire generation is already missing. This means few mature breeding age fish remain to sustain the population. This traditional fish camp is known as Wedgwood. This camp is located on the Nechaco River after the Stuart Nechaco River confluence. Wedgwood has been in the late Mary John Sr.'s family for many generations. She was originally from Slately, a reservation north of Prince George. She moved to Sykes to marry her late husband, Lazar John. Mary's daughter, Florence Teed, and her children are now the caretakers of the camp. They are following in the footsteps of their ancestors and teach the younger generation the importance of keeping this camp strong and alive.
I'm Jerry Mole from Ty Guys Reserve. Coming down here since I was a little kid, not to this camp, but my grandmother's camp, which is about seven miles upriver. Been coming here for about the last four years and fishing, hunting. Joyce Teed, I've been coming here since I was a kid. Stopped for a while and back at it for the last eight years, ten years. Camp Cook. <laughs> <laughs> and um, my name is Randy Teed and I'm from the Recycles First Nations. Well, this actually camp has been actually in the family there for actually quite some time and it's actually part of what we do in this actually cultural camp is there we actually probably get it there for um, sockeye salmon and, and we go probably hunting for moose and yeah they're actually part of fishing for salmon is actually really important there for actually not only for my actually family but there for actually first nations actually as a whole and actually proficient there and there gives us their great actually sustenance and it's a good actually food product there to feed on Dak health people have lived in harmony with white sturgeon, utilizing the population in this system for thousands of years. Sturgeon have been valued by First Nations people for food, medicinal properties, and ceremonial purposes. The recruitment problems currently facing the Nechaka white sturgeon were not caused by the historical harvest or practices of the Dak health people. Regardless, the sturgeon population has reached a critically low level and all people must take an active role before they are gone forever. And when we were younger, we used to eat the sturgeon quite a bit because there was lots of them. Now, now we just catch them, look at them, Cora measures them, and we be very careful and release them so they're unharmed. It's changed quite a bit since we were young. There's less salmon and it seems like there's less salmon every year. Last year was a really good year. This year is going not too bad neither. But we've caught and released eight sturgeon so far and they've ripped our nets to shreds. And before when we were young we used to wish we were catching sturgeon because we were eating them. But now we're wishing we don't because they rip up our nets so bad. And there's always a possibility of getting your boat flipped if it's a really big sturgeon and we're in a small boat. I don't know how our grandparents used to do it in canoes. We have aluminum in boats and we still have a hard time. So our grandparents must have been really tough and know a lot more than we do still. So how many do you usually catch in a year? We usually got two, one to two a year, if, if that at all. I don't know why we got so many this year. Do you usually set in the same spots that you do now? We, every year it's the same spots. There's three, three main spots. There's the gold mine, we call it the gold mine because there's always lots of salmon in that. And the one down below, there's a back eddy there that we've been doing really good this year. And down below we've been catching sturgeon. And nothing but sturgeon. We'll have four or five salmon and mostly sturgeon down below. And they're pretty tenderized by the time we take them out of the net because the stirs and you roll them around all night and they're soft. But still good. Have you caught sturgeon in each spot? In two of the spots so far, one hasn't got a sturgeon in it yet. That's the net we pulled today didn't that we haven't caught nothing in that one yet. It's just up at the gold mine and down below. We didn't set last night down below because it was too late when we got home. In your opinion. What would be the best reason for conserving sturgeon? Just so our great grandkids can see them too. Mm -hmm. least we want our kids to see them, realize that they're in there. A lot of people don't realize how big the sturgeons are and how big they get. Yeah, I remember the first one I seen when I was about eight or nine. Had it on shore, they already cut the head off. The darn thing was still breathing. <laughs> we were throwing rocks in it, the darn head must have been bought like that. Yeah. That huge, it's going to come up to a cure on me when I was that small. <laughs> quite a few of us throwing rocks in his mouth. It used to be a form of substance, and it might be again, just like anything else. If enough of them come back, maybe we'll start eating, eating them again. 
the way it is now, I guess we just can't eat them because there's not enough of them. Mm -hmm. And there's laws against that, I guess. But they they don't die in the nets. They just don't. I've never seen a sturgeon die in a net because they are really tough fish. They don't just die. Yeah. I mean, I'd imagine if they got caught in a net for a couple of days, but we take them out every morning. There's no way that we're not going to take out our nets every morning. Yeah, well, I don't mind taking them out of the net. It's kind of a nice feeling to watch them swim away, like a fish that big that's probably really old. And it's going to be there for a long, long time still. We may catch it again next year and let go of the same fish. So, who knows, we might have caught a couple already of the same fish that we let go. So it's, it's, it's not really hard to, it's just hard to look at your net after they trash it. Because you know you're not going to catch as many salmon with that net because of the surgeon. But it is a nice feeling to watch them swim away. I don't mind it at all. And then they get into the middle of the river, they roll for some reason, I don't know why they do that when we release them. They get into the middle of the river and they roll. I don't know why they do that, but they do it every time, just about. And the, because they're with the um, Ashy Sturgeon, they're being Ashy protected. They're just to Ashy support. They're what Ashy Cora and Jerry's been saying. There, it is Ashy beautiful Ashy species of fish, and there are Ashy low numbers there of the species in the Ashy Nachaco River, and it's Ashy important there for. Actually, us as a people, there to actually help, there to actually protect that species there, so our younger generation could actually see for themselves there what a beautiful actually fish there the sturgeon is. It's just important there for to actually think of future generations. And as for the actually proper cultural side of it, as for actually proper gillnetting our sockeye salmon, they're actually on this river. There would be nice for us there as actually carrier people for to have the actually for gill netting actually fishing season probably expanded there to actually more runs instead of this this is actually one run there that we're um, benefiting from and so once we get that there the actually earlier runs and maybe we'd be able to catch more and be able to actually provide actually our community there was actually sockeye salmon but now with the runs they're being so low we're catching about only maybe 30 to 40 a day that's just enough there to actually cover they're the main family that's here but there once you start they're catching more fish and actually more people from our community would actually benefit there from us actually being here How many do you like to have for the winter? About 200. Is that right? Of course, I hit, I hit about, oh, yeah. I, who couldn't do fish, I give yeah. them fish. Yeah. And if I catch too much, I, I do it for them and I give it to them. Yeah. And how long do they have to smoke there? About one week. You just keep hanging it and yeah. after it's dry, you put it away. Nice. Isaac and Peggy, what's the attitude of fisher people towards the sturgeon? When you... are scared of it, some people? Some people are scared of it, like in Takla, they tip, um, a sturgeon tip over a boat with them, and they're really scared of it. Mm -hmm. But the first time we caught that one big one, um, we were making noise, I guess, and me and her, it was a big boat we had, and then this thing is slapped that what really hard like a bullet, eh? really loud it sound. And we come down then he was stuck only on one fin, one of his fins on the back. He was only one, it was kinda not even stuck, it was just only. And I took it off and I pat him on the back and he went. <laughs> and do you think it's important that those sturgeon caught in the nets are properly released and go on to survive? It's very important yeah. to release them because they're almost extinct. Yeah. I haven't heard anybody catching sturgeon all summer or the last year or year before, I think, about then. Yeah. They caught sturgeon and 
but they usually catch it. Uh, somebody usually does. Okay. How long have you been setting nets, Peggy? Um, for a long time, maybe 15 years since I was 20 young. 20 years, maybe. Yeah, about 20, 20 years. 30 years, yeah. maybe. <laughs> And um, that one time my sister-in-law and I, we set net out here and we caught the sturgeon, her and I, we took it out to us. Everybody was sleeping and she got scared and that sturgeon just jumped up real high and I told her, calm down, Marie, you got big calm. You can't get scared, that thing, it feels you, just like it knows your feelings. And then she calmed down and I said, just paddle and don't try not to make noise. And we made it to that wharf over there. And we tied it on the wharf and this one guy came running over and he just grabbed the net like that surgeon just went rolling out and he just went swimming away. And here, when we make noise, it just gets real violent and it could tip our boat over. So we've got to be really careful. So when you have them in, do you know about the technique of bringing them to shore and taking them out of the net? Yeah, um, Walter Jr. He showed us how to um, Make them go back out like if they're upside down. You just turn them over and you keep um, patting them and like let them stay upside down and roll them around. Roll them back and forth like that until they start moving and they go back to the deep water and they swim away. The majority of salmon fisheries that take place in the Nachaco River use gill nets. The white sturgeon are occasionally encountered as bycatch during these fisheries. The idea for the boat kit came about from an observation from a catch monitor. They noted that a number of Nachaka white sturgeon became tangled in the gill nets each year. Despite being caught, most of them were live released. Since May of 2011, food, social, and ceremonial fishing licenses have included a clause requiring the mandatory release of white sturgeon whenever caught. This direction comes about as a result of the inclusion of the Nachaco white sturgeon as a listed species in the Species at Risk Act. The Nachaco White Sturgeon Recovery Initiative and the Carrier Sakani Tribal Council have several objectives and goals in designing and providing these boat kits to fisher families. We seek to provide necessary in-boat tools to successfully release live sturgeon from nets and also to provide fisher families with necessary tools to fix those nets when damage occurs from efforts to secure live release of sturgeon. The goal of the program is an immediate reduction in the harm to and deaths of sturgeon in the Nachaco Stewart Tackle system in the First Nation gillnet salmon fishery. In an attempt to save the sturgeon in this system from extinction, we are requesting that fishers release any white sturgeon caught, and we hope this video will be of assistance in doing so. This is our boat kit. This is a patch to patch the bigger holes in your net. And it's 15 by 15 feet. These are some cotton gloves to put on while you're handling the sturgeon so that you don't get cut by their scoops. A set of pliers to help you release the fish from the net or take hooks out. A roll of mending twine to repair your float line or lead line. There are two mending needles. Some electrical tape to stop fraying of any rope that you might have. A soft measuring tape to take the measurements of the sturgeon. A knife to cut the sturgeon out of the net. A waterproof camera to verify that you caught a sturgeon and released it and to show damage done to your nets. A pencil to 
to record your data on the waterproof data sheet. It also shows the measurements needed from the sturgeon. And it gives detailed instructions of what is needed. There are several ways you can acquire your boat kit. You can begin by checking first at your band office and see if there are any available there. If it turns out there aren't, you can call the Carrier Sakani Tribal Council Vanderhoof Warehouse at 250-567-5400 and they will arrange for kits to be delivered to your band office where you can pick them up. If you're in the Prince George area, you can also call in at the Carriers County Tribal Council office there. Their address is Suite 200, 1466th Avenue. Kits should be returned at the end of each season to be replenished. At that time, you should hand in your film for processing. The Nachaco White Sturgeon Recovery Initiative will endeavor to secure funding for these kits each year. In this sequence, I am working with Flo's son-in-law, Jerry Mole. He has also grown up catching fish around Wedgwood. His family's camp was located further upriver. Jerry and the family have caught and released eight sturgeons so far this year. As we pull the net, we find two more after an all-night set. Our first task is to take the sturgeon to shore and start the process. It is safer on shore, as they are a very strong fish and can easily pull you in the water. It's important to tie the rope around the tail of the sturgeon before attempting to untangle the rest of the fish. They are much easier to work with this way, and it eliminates the chances of them escaping before you get to process it. If you are using a rope, which is rough to the touch, please put a cotton cloth underneath to protect the skin from developing sores. If you choose to untangle the sturgeon before tying the rope to the sword, you can see here what might happen. Luckily, this sturgeon did not escape. To calm the sturgeon, it's a good idea to flip them over, ensuring their head and body remain underwater and not resting on the river's bottom. As you can see, they become very docile and easy to work with. Okay, get your measurements. It's important to use the camera provided in the boat kit to show evidence of the sturgeon being caught. Get someone to record the measurements on the data form provided. Remove the measuring tape from the boat kit. The first measurement taken is the girth as shown in red on the diagram. This is taken around the body just behind the pectoral fins. The next measurement needed is the post orbital shown in yellow. This is taken from the tip of the nose to the edge of the eye. Then the post opercular shown in blue. 
from the tip of the nose to the edge of the gill plate. The last measurement will be the length, shown in green, from the tip of the nose along the side of the body to the fork in the tail. To the edge of the eye. Oh, eight. Oh. Eight. Oh. 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 To the edge of the gill, seventeen. <laughs> Told you I heard something splashing. Yeah. All the way down the length of his body. <laughs> if you have a pit tag reader available to you, the next step will be to scan the sturgeon along its underside, along each side, and then along the top of the body, being sure to go over the head, dorsal fin, and tail. These areas are common places for pit tags to be placed. Be sure to record any of the tag numbers from the pit tag reader as they will not be saved for you. When scanning for a pit tags, take note of a radio tag that might be present in the fish you will see an antenna or evidence of an antenna coming from the underside of the fish. Take note of any markings on the fish or any injuries the fish might have acquired while in the net. The scoots on the side of the fish could be missing as a sign of the fish being caught already. Missing scoots give information as to when the fish was caught. A fish with only one missing scoot is a wild fish, and the missing scoot indicates nothing more than that it has already been caught. Two missing scoots indicates a hatchery fish. Scoot markings take place at the hatchery and indicates the year of release. The number of scoots missing indicates the number of years after 2000 that the fish was released. In this example, the fish was released in 2008. There may be evidence of two samples taken from the sturgeon. This will also indicate that it has been caught before. As you see in the diagram, there may be a scar where the H structure was taken at the root of the fin. It is very common for the fin to grow back, so it might be hard to identify whether anything was taken. The second sample is a piece of the fin taken from the tip as you see in the diagram. This too may be hard to identify as the fin will also grow back. No scars. There's some damage to his tail yeah. on the net. Yeah. Signs of stress. Yeah. No, it's 
See his tail is going red. That's a sign of stress. Their belly will all be red. Right red if it's ready to ready to die, you know, you have to get it back in the water. You good to go? Yeah. He's untied, I just Okay. You don't push them in the water, you let them swim away freely. There's a number. I'll just go over it again. 424D3B. In this sequence, we are now processing the second sturgeon. Each sturgeon is processed in the same way. Juvenile sturgeon, like the one here, will require the use of cotton gloves from the boat kit. These smaller sturgeon will have scoots which are much sharper and they will cut you if you're not protected. You will see here, there is a pit tag found and the number was recorded. There was also a missing scoot found and recorded. The missing scoots do not always indicate a year of previous capture. It may only be a single marking indicating the fish was previously caught. Make sure all the pertinent data is collected as this will help in the research needed for the Nechaco white sturgeon. Just hold them up. He's good. Just. Yeah. This one does have a. But they did take a chunk out of there. There's some marks from the net on his head. On some of his fins and on his tail. It's now time to release the fish. And be sure to release the fish away from where you normally set your net. This lessens the chances of recapturing the sturgeon. The white sturgeon gets its name from the pale markings along its belly and sides. The long, streamlined body has no scales. Instead, it has bony plates called scoots. These scoots are arranged in a row along the top of the fish and two rows along each side. Although their heads and tails may resemble sharks, sturgeon actually have no teeth. The sturgeon is well adapted for bottom feeding. Its toothless mouth is on the underside of its head and extends out of its body in order to suck up food. White sturgeon also have whiskers or barbells located between the snout and the mouth which help it find edible objects. These barbells are extremely sensitive to odors and can be easily damaged which could impair the sturgeon finding food. When handling the fish, avoid the barbells and gills. Gills are the lungs of the fish. There is no doubt that sturgeon can cause damage to salmon gill nets when they become entangled in the nets. You can see an area in here where the net's been damaged by this sturgeon. This portion of the video is meant to provide instruction in mending nets damaged by sturgeon bycatch using the tools and materials provided in the boat kit. Hazel Alexis and Rodney Teed are two experienced net menders from Sycus. In this next section they're going to demonstrate some of the techniques in net mending and following that we'll move on to a system of net mending that can be used with the materials that are in the boat kit. Hazel will begin by demonstrating how to load the mending twine onto the needle. I, I put it in the on. 
just keep turning like that. And I think that should be enough. Now that the needle is fully wound with mending thread, Hazel begins the task of reconstructing the damaged squares in the net. In this next section, we start with this hole in a net. Rodney Teed and Hazel demonstrate how rebuilt squares are sized and how the hole is repaired square by square. Here Rodney is using his open hand to get the proper size for the square he's rebuilding and you can see him putting in the knot to complete the square. This is already driving me crazy. <laughs> right there. From this point, the process continues to rebuild the remaining squares until the net mending is complete. In the following section, we are going to describe one method of net mending, making use of the materials in the boat kit. In this video, we are going to discuss a method particularly suited to use with the boat kit. It involves identifying good or anchor knots and then trimming broken twines back close to the knots. Then, depending on whether the hole is small or large, single twine mending can be done or patch repairs can be carried out. The boat material is suitable for both types of repairs. This video does not teach knot tying, but as you can see on the slide, it is important that the knots do not slip and change the size of the mesh. Learning how to tie knots is something best learned directly from experienced net menders. We are going to begin with the repair of a small hole. Here you can see the general outline of the hole and within that outline are these small green dots that you'll see. Those dots indicate the position of anchor knots and these are the first good knots once you go backwards along the mesh line from the point where the twine is broken. The anchor knots are used as the starting points to rebuild the net mesh. Begin by taking a knife in the boat kit and trimming the loose ends back close as you see here. About a quarter inch is what you want to leave sticking out of the end of these knots just so that the knots don't unravel under any kind of pressure. Use the needle with twine wound onto the needle handle. Begin with this horizontal twine along here. Attach the twine firmly to the left anchor knot. Then measure the distance between the knots on the good part of the net. 
Hazel and Rodney use a method of sliding their hand with outstretched fingers into a good section of the net to measure the correct spacing. Using the correct spacing, make knots along the horizontal twine so they fall in the right place for the vertical twines when you place them. A simple loop with the twine pulled through once will work. In this case you need three loops. Do not pull tight until you have the vertical twines in place. Set up this left vertical twine. Secure it to the top anchor up here and then slide the twine through the loop in the horizontal twine and bring your loose end down to the area of the bottom anchor knot. It's not necessary right now that you attach it. Do the same thing with the other two vertical twines. And when you've finished, put tension on the horizontal twine so that its loops close tightly about the loops in the vertical twines. Then without distorting the overall shape of the mesh, securely attach the horizontal twine end to the right anchor knot here. Do the same with each vertical twine. When your knots are all tight, you can trim back your loose ends to about a quarter inch from the knot and your small hole repair is complete. Sturgeon can make quite large holes in a gill net. Large holes are best mended using the patch material in the boat kit, shown here by Cora. Begin again by trimming loose ends back close to the anchor knots as you see here. Take one edge of your patch material, such as you see in this area here on the left edge, and lay it over the hole with the hole stretched taut at the corners rather than lying loose on your mending surface. Drape the patch material over the hole as you see here, pull taut but not so taut as to distort the shapes of the mesh. Here the patch material is shown in blue and the original net in green. Trim the patch so that loose twines extend beyond the anchor knots around the hole in this area here. Give yourself this extra bit of twine because you're going to use that twine to secure these knots. Secure the patch by wrapping each loose end around its corresponding anchor knot. Trim the loose ends back to a quarter inch of the knot and your large hole patch is complete. If we talk not a star, we stay. What a snee, what a snee, if we take another star, we stay. What a snee, what a snee, what a snee. If we take another star, we stay. What a snee. So to you in your opinion, what would be the what would be the best reason for conserving sturgeon? Just so our great grandkids can see them too. We want our kids to see them realize that they're in there. A lot of people don't realize how big the sturgeons are and how big they get. If we talk not a star, we stay. What a snee, what a snee. If we take another star, we stay. What a snee. What a snee. What a snee. 
a waiter can have a stairway stain. What a We are stewards of this resource. We have a chance to make a difference in the recovery of this magnificent endangered fish.